terrified to see so many people. Um, this is the third time I've done the, uh, the startup school on social media. Um, I think one of the neat things about this event that Ryerson puts on in a, in a, in a way that maybe only Ryerson can, you get to hear a bunch of different perspectives on a bunch of different topics from, from, from some di very different people. And those of you who've been coming to all of the startup school talks will know maybe they're not always what you expected. Um, I hope that, uh, that what I have for you tonight is interesting and, I, and I'll talk about where I'm coming from uh, a little bit in a sec. But this, talk, this presentation, and this, we're gonna go for about an hour and a half, um, is going to look at the question of what's in it for startups uh, using social media as a, as a tool for promoting and, uh, and getting people involved. And, and I'm going to take a pretty critical perspective. Um, I'll say that right off the bat. You often go to these things and they're self-styled social media gurus who are telling you um, the, the key to, to winning social media is just be awesome and, and don't suck. Or something that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you something like that. I'm not even going to tell you really whether or not you should do it, but I'm going to take a critical perspective that's informed by research that, that I've been doing for the last few years um, on the way that corporations and organizations use social media, and, and in fact on the evolution of the social media marketing or digital advertising industry. Uh, so yeah, the, the talk that I was asked to prepare, um, the, we call it this year social media maximization. Um, in the past, we framed it as social media 101 uh, for startups. But the big question that I was asked to weigh in on is the question of whether or not it's, it's worthwhile for most startups to invest heavily in professional social media activities. And, and the follow-up, I think, that comes logically from that is the question of if they do, how? So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some specific examples because what I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not here to tell you what you should do, but I'm going to tell you um, and think about some of the things that, that we could do and that have been done. So I want to start with an example of really good use of uh, commercial organizations on social media. Uh, so the good, but also the bad. So this is one um, I like. This is during the, the 2014 mayoral election campaign in Toronto. Salad King with, uh, with their creative advertising industry put, uh, agency put together a campaign on social media where they were joking that Salad King, the restaurant across the street, which we all no love, um, was running for mayor of Toronto, so they put together a, a platform which they communicated over social media. Um, they, were, they were having a transit plan, all roads lead to Salad King. Uh, they were having a, uh, uh, what else, uh, social issues, etc. cetera. Uh, and what they got out of that was something which I'll return to later, which is the idea of earned media. So they got attention from other places that have big following towards what their company was doing. And they got attention for things that weren't really at the core of what their company was doing, but it was very positive um, brand equity, I think they were getting. So for example, here's one of the major uh, reporters covering the election beat who was actually talking about the Salad King joke. Um, and you can see they're getting basically free press from mainstream sources um, who were very interested um, in what they were doing. So that's the good. And here's the bad, and I think the bad's really important, and in particular for people who are at the startup phase to think about. So this is kind of a classic um, negative outcome, uh, and then saving the negative outcome story in social media marketing. So the American Red Cross, which I'm sure everyone knows what it is, you know, a big not-for-profit organization, they help people in war zones. Um, <laughs> they gave the keys to one of their social media platforms to, I think it was an intern, who got mixed up on her phone and had a personal social media as well as the Red Cross, the American Red Cross social media. And somehow things got, the lines got crossed and she tweeted out under the heading of the American Red Cross's Twitter feed, Ryan found four more packs of dogfish heads minus touch beer. When we drink, we do it right. Hashtag getting slizzard on the, the, the uh, Twitter feed of the American Red Cross which is clearly not a message for the American Red Cross. Um, but fortunately, and this is where people always like to point to, so they say the CEO happened to be online and also have an admin password to get into the Twitter feed and immediately came over the top and, and made a nice little joke and comment about it. And it kind of went away. So the point is you can do really creative, clever things on, uh, on social media that attract really positive attention to your brand, but you can also really easily cause a disaster 
Um, and, and this is kind of, uh, I think, the, the point that I'd like to make in introducing the bigger question, the first of the two questions um, that, that Frank Martin and I talk about, which is whether or not it's valid, it's, it's viable and important for startups to focus during the startup phase on heavily investing in social media. Anyway, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Creative Industries here at Ryerson, which is that way. Um, for the past six years, I've directed a series of research projects into the relationship between internet users, social media firms, and the advertising industry. So I'm looking, broadly speaking, at how work in the advertising industry is changing because of social media tools, uh, and also um, at, at how uh, new practices are evolving, and in particular, what the role of data is within all of those. Big data. Um, above all. So um, you can contact me, I'll leave some cards up at the front since that didn't display properly. But the agenda for the talk, I'm going to talk quickly about social media. I'm just going to see, 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 see a show of hands. How many people have no notion of social media and aren't on any social media platforms? A couple of people. Okay. Uh, then I'll go through that a little quicker. The, the first time I did this, I was specifically asked, be prepared to prepare something for people who've never been on. I didn't believe those people existed. And then when we came, there was lots of people. So uh, if I skip over slides, that's why. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about key issues and concerns for social media and startups. Thirdly, uh, about using social media to communicate, which I'm going to distinguish from using social media to market and to advertise. And then fourth, I'm going to talk, which I think is the big point I'm going to make today, uh, about startups and strategic communication on social media. So the, the point of strategic communication is key. Most of what I'm going to present today um, is based on the research that I've been doing, which has involved interviews with people in the advertising industry, um, research with internet users, and, and also uh, looking in particular at industry structure and how it's been changing and the kinds of companies and services that are evolving as, as social media becomes an important focus for the advertising industry. So the key arguments that I'm going to make in the first place is that all organizations, and in particular startups, need to be very careful um, and develop a long-term digital strategy eventually. And I'm going to return to the point about strategy over and over again. Um, I'm going to suggest that to answer the question of, of should or should not start, startups invest in social, I'm going to suggest that if done right, a social media can create a market, help you recruit talent and network with potential investors. Um, but that on balance, developing a social media presence is probably, for most startups, a high-risk, low-reward uh, proposition, and that it involves a considerable amount of resource investment during the startup phase. And one, thing, one point I'm going to go back to over and over again is probably more work than you think. Um, it's one of those things that's easy to do it cheaply and dangerously, but it's hard to do it the way that Sally King did it, um, cleverly and, and something that's lauded and attracts positive attention. So I'm going to suggest that uh, we need to, it, doing those things involves thinking of what might seem like they're distinct activities of paid advertising activities on social media, but at the same time speaking in a narrative voice and doing persuasive strategic communication on behalf of your company. They seem like they might be two different things, but they're really not. They're all part of, of what I'm going to talk about repeatedly as a digital strategy. Quickly before I get into it, I want to thank uh, a couple of students, Marissa and Yanina, who helped me, um, also the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, who funded this research. Uh, and definitely, and I guess it's the last one of the year, so thank you so much to, to Cleo and, and Sean Wise and the entire uh, Startup School team. It's, it's been fun to be included in this. Um, so, the first part, the brief introduction of social media and taking social media seriously. So one of the challenges, and it's, it's interesting, as I've, as I've done versions of this, it's become less and less of a challenge. But often we find it to be a bit of a cognitive disconnect to take social media seriously and think about it in a business context. It's something that, in particular to many students, is seen as a trivial activity. Right? It's something we do to escape from things like thinking about how to build a business. Um, and it's also something we take for granted. But I, I'm from a social science tradition and a cultural studies tradition, and uh, the basis of what I'm going to present today is that we need to, to treat it as a very serious object. And in particular, we need to treat the decisions that people and startups make about what to do or not do in social media as something very serious. So I, I invite you to kind of release any hang-up you might have if you're very active on Snapchat or Tinder or 
or, uh, or any other social media platforms that you have trouble thinking of as serious objects for analysis or strategic thinking and kind of check that at the door because it, it is really important and it, um, it's, it's important to, to, to take a very, uh, I think, serious view of it in particular before you decide to casually commit to, uh, to engaging in social media communication as a startup. So a definition of social media, and it, it, it generally falls under um, at least nine negative definitions. We know when we see it, but one of the classic ones are uh, by Boyd and Allison that they define social network sites as web-based services that allow individuals to do a series of things. I'm going to I'm going to go through them. Um, I'm going to go through them individually. So one is to con conduct a public or semi-public profile within a bounded system. So th that effectively means it's a form of online communication platform in which the people who use it all have their own profiles. And those profiles are all connected in that they all live within the same platform. So Facebook, everybody has a, has a Facebook profile. Those Facebook profiles mostly connect through the Facebook platform itself. Secondly, it allows you to articulate a list of other users with whom you share a connection. So one thing that almost every easily identifiable social network platform has in common is that they allow you to take this profile that you create and link it up in some way with other profiles. Um, and you can right away think, you know, they, they look a little bit differently, but they're all basically doing the same thing. Whether it's Twitter or Snapchat or Facebook, all of them have some way for once you make friends or whatever, however else we define that connection. You're basically linking personal profiles. You're connecting islands of individuals or organizations through the medium of a communication platform. Uh, and three, you can, as they say, view and traverse the connections within the system. The nature changes from uh, from from one side to the other. And all that is to say is that you can navigate and communicate with individuals um, in groups or individually over the. Platform. So one of the things that all social network platforms do is allow people to collect contacts of some kind and then strategically communicate with groups of them. Right? You can pick to communicate with everybody or an individual over that network. And you know you're talking to them because you have these, um, these identified logins. So to that I would add, social media platforms have defined niches in terms of their content or context which is not always totally clear, but for whatever reason we know the circumstances under which we would use WhatsApp versus Facebook versus Tinder um, versus MySpace, uh, if we were for any reason inclined to use MySpace in 2015 at all. But in any case, yeah, they all tend to have a specific kind of role that they play or a specific type of, of communication uh, or purpose that, that we, that are either built hardwired into the, the role of the, uh, of the site, so Tinder is explicitly a dating site, uh, but often it's much more kind of cultural. Like there's some kind of social norm that evolves, and in particular when you talk to younger people, they'll know under what circumstances they're gonna communicate with a friend over Snapchat versus Facebook. They're often used to circulate commercial and organizational communication, alongside in their personal communication. I think this one's really important in return to later. Uh, and that's one of the sneaky things about social networks. Um, the idea, I mean, we, we totally accept this unproblematically in 2015, but the idea that uh, in Facebook, me, Jeremy Stern, could be friends with Nespresso, uh, but also friends with some kid from grade two that I wouldn't say hi to if I saw him walking down the street, um, and then at the same time be friends with my best friend. It, 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 is, it is significant, I think, when we think about it in terms of the questions we're asking here. And it's also a bit strange. <laughs> it's also a bit of a strange place we've come to in that these bound social, social connections that we make through social media involve often treating companies and brands and organizations interchangeably with people. We talk about the relationships that we have with people and brands interchangeably. Uh, they, they provide for uh, data or for personal organizational branding and persona building, and that's become a major part of it. And that's often what we talk about when we talk about social media marketing. We're not talking about um, just communicating an organization. 
or a, a, in particular in the case of a startup, we're talking about building the persona uh, of that organization. So they tend to be advertising supported, which I think is, is important when you're talking about it uh, in terms of a, an a professional context that you want to use it in. They're advertising supported and be subtly optimized for commercial organizational use. Uh, and they tend to make money by leveraging the data, the time, and the, uh, the investment that users make in populating the content. So I think, I think, I mean, I think that's, that's important too. It's an important perspective to think about putting a company on social media. So really quickly, this is Facebook, obviously. Um, a, a site called Running With The Blue Bed Sheet Sells Stuff. But <laughs> you can see all the basics. You have the 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 collection of um, the collection of other user profiles. People post messages. They can respond on other people's walls. Um, this is Twitter. This is my Twitter. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. You will not get a lot of tweets. I, I I'm way up. This is 36. I think last year I'm up to like 63 now. Uh, someone actually talked about that. I'm on like a pace of like. Someone said, "Oh, you just joined?" And, no, I've been on since I think it was 2011. I think I'm I'm like. A, a solo 13 tweets a year. Um, but yeah, maybe after I get tenure, I'll start, I'll start tweeting. I, mean, there's, there's, I have some observations to make about the world that maybe are best kept unmade for a while. In any case, uh, so same thing, same idea. People post messages, in this case, Twitter. It's, uh, it's short, 140 character uh, messages, but people have connections and they're supported. And hashtags are used on many, um, Twitter in particular, but on many social media to organize discussions under keywords. So you can see this was my, for example, um, one of my 36 tweets at the time was my entrance into my, my family's Christmas cookie contest. And they were called uh, Rob Ford's Very Merry Christmas Shortbread. Um, this one was the gravy train. This was, um, I think there was something about crack. I can't remember there was a crack in the cookie. That was passing the football. That one was drunken stupor, and I poured ouzo all over it, so it, it smelled. It was like a little gingerbread man who was holding a bottle and it smelled like alcohol. Uh, anyway, so I, I, didn't, I didn't wait. But that's what you can do on Twitter. You can post it, and then you can, if, if everyone in my family had put hashtag Christmas cookies, they would have all been able to find the discussion and follow the discussion. Um, YouTube, obviously, um, not necessarily thought of as a social network, but very much is one. If we think about the definition, very important in terms of any social media marketing campaign, I think. Uh, LinkedIn is a, mark, is a uh, social media for professional contacts, which inexplicably also has great news adver vodka advertising on it, apparently. Um, and uh, then there's additional ones like Instagram. Uh, as my student who helped prepare this wrote, it's, it's like Twitter, but for photos. And now it says, it's like Twitter, but for, Kar for Kardashians. Um, Snapchat is a short, uh, short message. It, the 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 messages come and then they vanish. Which uh, Pinterest is a professional style of sharing, and, and for certain startups, it's a really good place to start. Which I won't talk about too much. Vine, like Instagram, but for shorter videos. Google Plus, which I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, was sort of a failed initiative launched by Google to compete with Facebook, which is predominantly um, hosted tech sector professionals discussions now. So a brief introduction to, to social media. I'm going to move on. I, I hope that's enough on social media. In the past, as I said, I spent more on that. But I get the sense we don't need it. I never really thought we needed it, but I was always surprised how much we did. Anyway, so some of the key issues facing social media startups. And again, here's where I'm going to return to the big question, which I was asked at the beginning of this to develop the presentation around, which is, should, so, should startups be active on social media? Yeah prior to going to market or launching. And me being a social scientist, uh, as I mentioned, if, you, if you've got the, the startup guru perspective on this, the answer would be, oh, of course. And if you got a, a, an entrepreneurship guru, they might be, no, focus on your core competencies. Um, and me being a social scientist, the answer is, well, maybe, 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 maybe not. It, it depends. So I'm going to talk you through the, the it depends, but I just want to make sure everybody's prepared for the it depends answer. So there's a lot of, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of best practice social media guru advice you can get. And I've included some, some links in here uh, on the internet, on other places. If you go to any kind of uh, trade shows, 
in either in the advertising world or the tech sector or startups, there's always people who are talking about how easy it is to go on social media and be awesome. Um, and they have, they have some good advice, and I, I've reviewed a bunch of this presentation. It seems like the, the questions that, uh, or the overlaps between this include um, that a great social media strategy can be, uh, can be very good, very beneficial. I don't agree on that. I think that's pretty unwell. If you do anything great, it's probably going to work out. Uh, but from there, people really point to the, to the work challenge that it creates in particular for a lean startup. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But you can go on the, on the internet and get seven startup tips and eight startup tips and 15 startup tips. Um, I'm going to move past that. And some of these startup tips, if I can summarize, include the following. So these are the benefits. So the first is that it, 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 going on social for a startup can build a brand or market for your product prior to launch. Right? You've got something. The world doesn't know what it is. You can talk about it to the world. They'll might anticipate it. Um, it can be cheap marketing, although I'm going to problematize this in a second, the extent to which it actually is. Um, at the very least, I think it's safe to say it can be non-professional marketing which is often a substitute for cheap. It allows you to, to user test and get feedback on beta versions. So you can, put, you can put stuff out to the community, especially one of the things you can do on social is build up the community to find out who out there is interested in what you're doing and then um, ask them what they think of what you're doing while you're still putting it together. It can attract mainstream press, which for a startup is, I think, a really, really genuinely valuable marketing asset. In particular, the mainstream press is positive. It can monitor your position relative to competitors. So you can see how people are talking about your product relative to your competitors. You can just do what everybody does on social media with people they're interested in but afraid to approach. It's, you just stalk them. You can stalk your competitors on social media. That's one advantage of having a, a social media profile. Um, it can help you engage in marketing and advertising. It can get the attention of investors and, and possibly talented employees as well as customers. And the employee one, I think, is something that often gets overlooked. But that, I mean, how else would people find out about a startup that they would be interested in, in working with and maybe have something to contribute to? And if you need it, if it's in some way valuable to you, it gives you the chance to start collecting data on your customers um, and your market before you go to launch, which is valuable. Again, if you have access to people's data through the, the the login files that they have to make to get on the social media platforms. You can find out more about who your customers might be, who the people who really like what you're doing are, don't like it, etc. Um, and of course, something might go viral, rock viral, and your startup blows up, which I think I'm going to problematize very shortly. But it's of course a possibility. Right? You can all of a sudden become the talk of the internet and the mainstream press for a couple of days, and, and that would have a, an astronomical market effect on what you were doing. Now the possible risks, and again, this is this is sort of what putting a, a bunch of these best practice documents that are available out there, and, and what the gurus say, putting putting them together. The first is, I think, getting slizzard. Hashtag getting slizzard. You could massively screw up, um, and I think anyone who's who's spent any time on social media, in particular Twitter, understands at least intuitively the impact of of doing something embarrassing or getting in trouble or getting criticized on social media is often exponentially bigger than the impact of doing something right or getting complimented or being pointed to um, for, or being uh, acknowledged for doing something that people like. It, you may find that unprofessional content actually costs you brand equity rather than building it. So there's the legitimate possibility that having no public-facing content is better than having amateurish public-facing content. There's at least an air of mystery about your startup and what you're doing and what you're going to produce if you're just keeping it secret. Whereas if you go on the internet and you make spelling mistakes and it's not at all um, effective marketing, you don't have a voice or a persona for your organization, you're, giving, you're allowing people to fill in the blanks on what they think you're doing. And in the absence of a, of a product or, or being a market, that may be all they judge you on. Um, if the content is professional, it's intentional, it just it might not be cool. Right? Like you might actually do a very good job of communicating to people what you're all about, and you might do it in a, in a, in a passable, professional way. 
and they might not be interested. So they might give up on, 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 your, on your startup idea before you actually have a chance to bring it to market. Um, the bond, the, the bleed between company social media footprint and the personal social media profiles of founders, this one's in, uh, in, in uh, sorry, uh, certainly true and much tougher in particular for students and younger people who have very active social media activities online and then start talking about what they're doing in a startup through their personal social media profiles and then at some point those personal social media profiles bleed into the de facto or official startup company social media profile and all of that makes it very difficult to extricate when the person's talking in the voice of the company and on behalf of the company and when they're talking about uh, their own personal life. So it's, it's hard for, for some people to, to compartmentalize what the voice of the company is versus the voice of the individual. And in many cases, and I think in a lot of the really effective cases of, of startups using social media, the persona of the founders is purposely crafted to make a really interesting story and be part of the brand. And that's harder to do if you already have a big brand in social media. And this is a big one. You're forced to tell a story about, about, a, about your company or your product before you know how it ends. Right? That's a challenge to taking to social media before you've got a product in market. You're forced to engage with customers and fans before, who, who, before you know who they are. Uh, anyone who's, who's been involved in a startup that's pivoted, you can imagine you put all this effort into building one audience or one group of fans for something you haven't really done yet, and then you decide your company's doing something else. You're stuck, with, you're stuck with fans that are going to be disappointed, and you don't have new fans for the new thing. So sometimes, again, it's maybe better to wait until you know how the story of your company ends, or at least where the middle is, before you, you start telling that story. And, and then this is, I think, one of the most important and underestimated ones, which is the true investment of time during the startup phase that's required to effectively do social media. So uh, they estimate it's probably about between a quarter and a third of the job of one of the founders to professionally run a social media feed for a startup company. So at a time when you're lean and everybody's overworked and there's uh, really core um, product development and marketing functions that need to be done and aren't being done, you're talking about taking a third to a quarter of one of the founders' attention away and putting it into things like Instagram and Twitter. And it, it just may not be worth the reward at that point. So some mitigating points in that, um, I'd say this again, social's not free of time or money, and I think it's really important, especially students tend to think of social as, okay, well, we've got this great idea for a company and we'll be able to market it for free because we're really good at social media. It's never free. Uh, if you do it for free, if, if you think it's free, you're not doing it right. Uh, and I think the salad cake example is a really good one. To do it really, really well, it costs money. It costs money for professional services. It needs to be invested in. But it also costs a lot of time. And I think it's interesting to look at what some really successful serial entrepreneurs say about some of the functions that we might accomplish on social media and how important they are. So on the positive side for doing social media, here's. Uh, an angel investor named uh, Ron Conway. This is really important to own the mind of your users and your reputation is your biggest asset. So he thinks those are the kind of things, you, those are the kind of objectives you can accomplish with an effective social media campaign. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, the, one of the founders of Instagram specifically writes, don't watch Twitter when you launch. So I mean, his argument is just what, part of what you need to do is avoid social media, um, which is agreed upon by one of the founders of WhatsApp. One of his big uh, mantras for, for entrepreneurship is avoid distractions such as the press or investors. So avoid talking to people about your company when you need to. And of all people, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, one of his big things is this is the guy who makes us all be friends with people who aren't really our friends. His mantra for entrepreneurship is you shouldn't have more than 10 friends uh, engaged. So I think it's really significant that you look at uh, you look at the advice sorry, you look at the advice of, of a venture capitalist 
And he says, yes, absolutely. You should be owning people's minds and building your reputation. And then you look at the people who actually build social media platforms, and even they say, oh, don't be bothered. You have to be focused. You have to look at what you're doing. So yes, the investors, the people who are investing in the company, they're the ones who want you to draw attention to it. They want you to build a brand. They want you to attract a lot of positive brand equity before you launch. The people who are actually building companies, even the people who feel as passionately about social media as the founders of Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook, if you read between the lines on, on, the, on the kind of measures that they push for uh, entrepreneurship, they kind of suggest maybe you need to think twice about it. So you must understand that managing social requires professional communication skills. And I think that's really important. Um, it, this is a profession. It's a professional service. It's a very difficult one. It costs a lot of money to hire high-level advertising or PR professionals, professionals. And it's amazing how many engineers or MBAs uh, who make startups think they can do that on, on the basis of their self-training. Like, I, I can use Tinder, so obviously uh, I can get a lot of good press and uh, attract more investors to our startup. Um, I, I'd suggest that going viral is basically like winning the lottery. And the way I would describe this is, if your quote-unquote plan and the, the justification for getting on social media is, we're going to go on social media, we're going to do some kind of meme that's going to go viral, and then we're going to print money. That's not a good plan. You have to get a better plan. Nobody understands why certain things go viral. And at any given moment on the internet, I can guarantee you there are thousands of people trying to manufacture something going viral without success. And here's an example um, of, of two, by the way, that also that social can get away from you. So does anyone know who that is? It's getting a little old. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to find a new. There's, I think I have a better picture. Oh, there, that's it. He's just a kid with a good haircut. His name's Alex from Target. So he was a kid, I think it's in Texas somewhere, and some 14-year-olds took a picture of him because he was a cute boy at Target and put it on their Instagram. I think they actually put it on Twitter. It's put it on Twitter. Cute boy at Target. And then somehow it went viral because apparently it's clearly the only cute teenage boy with a Justin Bieber haircut in the world in 2011 who has a job. And so it went viral immediately. This was him on Ellen like the week later talking about how his life had changed in a week because the picture of a um, cute boy from Target went wild, it went viral. Um, and then the pushback happened. So a marketing company, or a so-called marketing company, uh, tried to take credit for having manufactured the, the viral meme. So they, they claimed, yeah, we wanted to see how powerful the fan growth demographic was by taking an unknown good looking kid and turning him into an internet sensation. Uh, and of course, they, that wasn't entirely truthful, at least according to Alex. He, Came out and you can look. One of the things, the reason I include this is like 19,000 favorites. Like, this is a kid who was working at Target, probably still is working at Target. 18,000 favorites, 33,000 favorites. Um, so, yeah, this is an example of two things. One, how arbitrary something going viral is. Two, the idea that that can be manufactured uh, just doesn't hold water. Even to the people for whom they go viral, they have no idea why it happened. Uh, and three, when you do something, like uh, make a big strategical mistake and try to claim something that you didn't do on the internet, there could be a huge pushback, as it was. So social can get away from you. Um, and and, and the, if the plan is going viral, that's no plan at all. And the sixth point I'd like to make uh, is that winning the social battle is no guarantee of winning the, the, the launch war. And in one of my classes this year, we looked at the, the social media campaigns of all the political parties during the federal election this year. And the students agreed, and I, I think they were right, that the liberals actually probably won the social media campaign. Every other time I've ever done that exercise with a class, the party that won the social media campaign was not the party that made the government. And I think that holds true in politics as much as it holds true, certainly, with new product launches and new uh, startup companies. Winning, having a great pre-launch social media campaign is absolutely, it's a help, uh, but it's no indication of a successful launch. And here's an example. Uh, I talked about this earlier, Google Plus. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers when Google Plus launched. We lost our collective minds about Google Plus launching. 
for a few weeks. I don't know, I think it was like, it was at the height of people's negative feelings about Facebook, the company. And you know, we just really, we, I, think, I think as a society, we really wanted Google Plus to work better than it does. Um, but in any case, it was really exciting to the point that, I, I don't know how many people remember this, but they actually, they were giving out invitation only access to the beta version of the site. So you had to be like, you either know somebody or know somebody who knew somebody in order to get an invite to be allowed to use Google Plus's beta before they officially launched it. And it was like people were climbing over it. It looks like if you could have represented this as a video, what people were doing on the internet, it would look like those Black Friday videos when people are fighting each other on the floor at Walmart over some, some PS2 game or whatever it is. Um, in any case, people were, were so excited about the, the launch. So they gave out a bunch of them. And they actually, this is the, the, the product development guy from, from Google making an announcement saying, we've shut down the invite mechanism for the night, insane demand, we need to do this carefully in a controlled way, thanks for your interest. For those of you who wish to leave, please remember you can also take it, it's your data. So what he's saying is, he's basically going outside of the club and taking the velvet rope and putting it across and saying, sorry guys, you waited in line for a couple of hours, but nobody's, nobody else is coming in. So he's cutting off the thing that, that all the customers were dying to have and this is his message telling them, loyal customers who really, really want something for us, they're super excited about it, you're not going to get it. And the response is incredible. Thank you for the invites. So sad you're doing, so sad you're doing, so glad you're doing it this way. Thank you. We'll be back up tomorrow. Thanks for the invite. Great work, babe. The Google Magic Hour will return. So they succeeded in managing the launch of Google Plus so well that literally people whose expectations they raised to a sky high level and then dashed were saying, thank you, great job, Nick, uh, on the internet. And yet, all of that happened and Google Plus is still basically a, a dead on arrival platform. So they could, literally could not have built up better equity in the platform and the company in the way that they managed the social media discussion and the social media engagement with the community before they launched the product. But none of that made Google Plus any better when it went to market. And in fact, it's kind of sad looking at this and I'm, I'm actually pretty sure this was the high moment of Google Plus probably. It's it, the, the moment when they shut down the, the by invitation only access to the beta tester was the high moment uh, of the social media platform. So to sum up, Doing a really great job of, of building community engagement and social, using social media prior to launch is actually no guarantee that when you do launch it's going to work. It certainly doesn't hurt, but it doesn't guarantee it. Which takes back to the question of should startups be active on social media prior to the market launch? And again, here I already teased this, but the answer is going to be a little of this, a little of that, and, and it, it depends. So I would say they should be if they understand the following, that it's one, tough at the startup phase, and that they can't go into it rashly, right? You, it can't be something you do as an afterthought. You have to have a careful plan. You have to have time and money budgeted for engaging in professional activity uh, on social media. You have to build for the long haul, so you have to implement a social media communication strategy and not just say, we're gonna throw something together and go viral, or we're gonna do a whole bunch of things and hope one of them goes viral. That's not the plan. Uh, as I said, there's no way you can ever hope to manufacture that. Um, you can understand it as a big risk with low reward, and I think the discussion, in particular when we start up between the partners, has to address it openly in those terms. Um, and then, this is what I'm gonna talk about the rest of the presentation, but you have to work towards professional communication and digital strategy. So again, you have to see it as not something you can do using your own so personal social media profile, it can't just be, uh, I'm really good at Tinder, therefore my company is going to be really successful on social media. It has to be something you think of in terms of a professional competency, a professional service, and part of a larger digital strategy. So, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how we do that and what that means. Um, I'm going to go through a few of the, of the more popular social media platforms. Uh, and some of the ways that we can use them strategically and professionally. And then I'm going to talk, generally speaking, uh, about kind of the state of the art uh, 
um, from the industry perspective on how to do this. So Facebook, it's not just for friends. Businesses are on Facebook. Um, customers expect 24-hour turnover. All the literature on, on Facebook marketing. One of the real advantages that it has for engagement with, with communities is that um, people's, people's uh, queries and communications are posted, and then everybody gets to see how quickly you respond. So if somebody sends you an email and you don't respond for three weeks, you've got one person who's annoying. One of the risks in social is if somebody posts a query to one of you on the Facebook page and you don't respond for three weeks, literally everybody else who gives a damn about your Facebook page sees that you spent, it took you three weeks to respond to that. So you need to respond quickly. Uh, Facebook branded pages uh, are a step up. So these are kind of organizational pages that you produce professionally. They're creative content. They're not advertisements. They generally have uh, a lot of information about your company that goes beyond just what a personal uh, Facebook profile would have. And, and again, at the high end, they can be creatively produced um, by professionals. Uh, photos, company culture, infographs, questions, polls, discounts, coupons, all kinds of stuff you can do to engage the people who form the community around your organization. So you should post with value. Um, it should be short and sweet. Pictures, uh, in particular on Facebook. Um, one of the research projects I have, we're using what are called eye tracking glasses. These are glasses that uh, target lasers to where your pupils are focused. And we have, we're auditing the way that people use social media. And it's really interesting to see the impact that a picture in a Facebook post has on people's attention. So they'll scroll down really quickly, and then as soon as the picture comes up, the eyes immediately go to the picture. And even if it's not something they care about at all, they will check the picture out. And posts that are just text, the strategy that people often use is to look to see who sent it. So they'll look to see what the name is, and if it's a name, if it's one of their, their best friends or someone they really trust, or see as an influencer, they will read it. If, they, if there's no picture, and the name's not from someone they feel that, that uh, it's, it's really important to read content from, they're just gonna skip over it. But a picture will at least get you attention. So um, contests, promoting likes, it's important if you're gonna do social media, again, to make it look like you're doing it well, so you want to drive attention and traffic. Um, direct questions with easy answers, link to rules and additional information if you have a, a contest, um, and also use deadlines. If you want to get people involved, set up little tasks and, and have them be time sensitive. Twitter, um, again, short, bite-sized content, uh, tweeting as it happens. Uh, Twitter is really important to develop a, a voice or for persona for your organization. Um, one of the strategies to keep a high volume of information in Twitter feed without having to constantly be producing new ideas is to just kind of curate information that's available that's relevant to your, to your company. And you see a lot of startups will do this. Rather than putting themselves out there by making proclamations or having opinions, they'll just constantly find things that are relevant. So if it's a travel company, they'll be posting articles about developments in the travel industry or whatever, or, or travel blogs. Um, photos, questions, contents, again, anything you can do to increase engagement and bring people coming back to, the, to, to your feed to check it over and over again. And so my student who helped me prepare the slides and I, mean, I was wondering about all the, the toilet paper material and she had when the, the story broke in the star about Ryerson and its toilet paper controversy. She actually found me in the hall and said, look, see, I told you toilet paper has really good PR. That's why. That was, that was her argument that, that it was a PR plant that got that story. It was a big story in the Star about how Ryerson uses one ply toilet paper about three weeks ago. It was actually on the front page of the Star. Uh, so her argument was, see, I'm, I'm, I'm validated in choosing it as, a, as the example that I, I put in the slides. It's because clearly there's an underwritten PR complex between uh, between powerful communications industries and the toilet paper industry. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. In any case, the examples all have toilet paper in this slide deck. So yeah, um, hashtags, again, um, hashtags are how people search for content. So hashtags can be used to basically form a de facto logo. The example given here is like hashtag AMA for the American Music Awards. It's a substitute for the logo of the organization. But they also are used to um, curate discussions. 
So if you know people are talking about a certain issue, you want to join the hashtag, you want to include the hashtag in your post, so that, that most of your, uh, of your feed will be, um, will be part of that discussion. And people will see it as such. Works on the paper. And this is an example of how hashtags have extended beyond just Twitter, where they started people are using hashtags across other social media, like Facebook. Again, it's just a way for organizing, uh, and it's also a way for cross-promoting um, discussions and brands and campaigns and ideas. So if you ended up with a hashtag that started in Twitter, you could, you could cross-promote it using it by using the hashtag on Facebook. So YouTube, um, YouTube's a really interesting space for marketing. If you think to the pre-internet advertising world, the absolute most expensive gold standard of advertising was of course like the little 30 second movie that we made about a product and put it on a, uh, in the middle of a, of a primetime television show. And now everybody can make movies about their products and they don't have to spend millions of dollars to buy access to eyeballs. Um, and they can make them longer than 30 seconds. So video is a very provocative way for companies to promote themselves, but also for professionals and people within those companies to talk about the company. So video blogging, professional video blogging is something a lot of people do. Um, promotional, making amateur promotional videos I think can be effective, but of course the challenge is video is easy to do poorly and very hard to do well. Uh, so it's once again, you have to think about the competencies that you have, the amount of time and resources that you have, and actually think about if you want to do a video, if it's really important for you to use a YouTube video as a way of telling the story of your startup, because you think it will lure investors, or you think it will build a market, or you think it will attract good employees, do it right, and actually invest in people who know how to make videos, like, like, like them. Get people who have headphones on, and, and wrap cables, and not, and not the, the guy who wants to be CFO. Uh, and a really important thing, again, in terms of um, viewing YouTube as a place to go viral, um, research shows that 1% of videos on YouTube receive 90% of the views. So just because you make something and post it on YouTube doesn't mean anyone's ever going to see it. There's literally billions of videos on YouTube that very, very few people watch. So LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn has tools for promoting businesses. LinkedIn can be a very effective way to just get the word out with the people that matter, to attract new employees, develop relationships with industry partners. Um, you can create blogs on LinkedIn, which I know a lot of people in startups do. The people who are in my LinkedIn have startups and always getting blogs and news feed entries. Um, the writing, um, you can do e-newsletters. You can also join industry groups. So LinkedIn organizes people's profiles. You're allowed to kind of declare on, I'm in the tech, Canadian tech sector or whatever, um, so it kind of allows you to be part of a, a larger um, group of, of similar companies that might be worthwhile. Uh, as, as, as this quote from one of the heads of, of marketing that a, a company says, LinkedIn, it, it allows them to identify their core audience. So if you're at a stage where you're much, you're much less interested in the kind of big public at large, but you're much more interested in making sure the right people know what you're doing, and in particular, if you're looking for future employees or investors, LinkedIn might be a good place. And it's not one that we often think about um, as, as, a, as a social media place, but the, I think the, the potential rewards can be compelling. Let's go over that. So, key issues and concerns using social media to communicate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using social media to market and advertise. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I think. The, the most important point to keep in mind is that I'm doing this purposely on the back of talking about using social media to communicate because I want you to think of both functions together. I think it, they're part of the same strategy. So I'm talking about them individually, but at the end I'm going to bring them back together. And I'm going to introduce uh, terms that are used in the advertising industry, which are paid media, owned media, and earned media. And I'm going to introduce them, and I'm going to talk about the significance of social media for startups in particular around earned media. So paid media in the advertising world is something you buy. You buy a billboard, you buy the right to put up a billboard, you pay someone to make the ad, you put it up there, you buy the right to have 30 seconds in the middle of, of Grey's Anatomy, and you pay someone to make a television commercial, you put it up there, that's paid media. So that applies in social media as well. And I already pointed out that it's kind of odd that Grey Goose Vodka gets to advertise Next, your professor is brought to you by Vodka. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly the, the, the brand I'd like to 
have, although if you're going to have a vodka, Grey Goose is probably I mean, a premium brand, right? That's not too bad. Anyway, so Grey Goose would have paid for the right to have this professionally produced ad put there in the same way that Grey Goose would if allowed, and I don't think they're no longer allowed, would have been allowed to get a, a, a banner, a, a bullet board ad, uh, and then that sort of thing. Paid media also exists in the feeds in social media. So here's an example from the screen grab from my, my Twitter of just a Canadian Tire commercial that's embedded in a, in, a, in a Twitter post from Canadian Tire's corporate feed. And that's something they would have paid for the right to do, right? They would have bought, the same way you buy traditional media, they would have bought the right to put that video there. Um, owned media is anything you build. So if a company builds something, that's, that's media they own. So if a company builds something that helps their marketing strategy or helps their brand, um, that's, something, that, that's something they own. So that could be as something as kind of um, mundane as like a trade, a trade, uh, trade show booth, um, but it, it certainly applies in the social media space. So something like a brand page on Facebook is owned media, right? Like they paid a little bit for it, but they had access to it because social media platforms are open to everybody. But they built it and they, they own it. So there's something they're running on a dynamic basis and they're certainly paying for it. But they're not, they're not paying to rent the, the ability to communicate in the same way that they are with a banner ad or a traditional television commercial. So that's own media. And then the golden ring in the advertising world has always been the third kind of media which is earned media. And I already gave you an example of this. So earned media is anytime somebody else gives positive reviews or promotions of your product or organization. Right? It can be word of mouth. So if you're a restaurant, earned media is if one customer tells another customer about how great your restaurant is. But the best and most effective kind of earned media has always been mainstream press coverage that's positive. Uh, and there is simply no way to beat the reach and impact of authentically positive media uh, coverage of your company. So in social media, we see that our media exists as well. We saw it with the salad bean example. So when journalists start tweeting about uh, a company doing something right, that counts as earned media. And. Um, the, I think the challenge to think about what a marketing effort for a company is in the social media space is kind of figuring out how the, how the opportunities exist to create more owned and earned media and go beyond just paid. So paid, there is paid advertising as we saw, but earned and owned media can be things that are interlaced in, in the news feed. So if you, uh, one example of, of owned media on social media is Twitter feed, right? Like if, if you to come up with a strategic voice and you pick the person who's going to do it and you carefully write stuff and you write talking points and messages and you put that out, that's something you, you earn. Sorry, you own. Um, but it's much more, uh, it's much more um, original, it's much more on voice, it's much more authentic. It doesn't come as top down, like looking at that, that great goose vodka. The difference would be between, for example, paid media and earned media would be that Grey Goose Vodka ad is, oh, is paid media, but if on my LinkedIn page it's, there was just this authentic review of how much I love Grey Goose Vodka, um, that would be something you earn. But it speaks to the advantages that I think exist for companies, in particular startups in this space. They can create stuff that's interlaced with news feeds, that's original, that's uh, earned or owned, that's posted by someone else intentionally, so if you get other people talking about your product, in particular if they're positive, um, and th that's different from kind of this. So you can pay to have a banner ad, you can pay to have, you know, if there's promoted recommendations or something like that. But uh, you can also, you, uh, ideally, you, you are producing something on your own that you're not paying for that people view as authentic content that speaks positively about your product. So I'm going to skip over this part about data. Um, one thing I would say is that one of the big advantages, one of the things that I think has to be part of your digital strategy is how to maximize the data benefits. So the advantage of social media advertising over traditional forms of advertising is that you can segment and target your, your audience and you can find out who's seeing your messaging. 
And those tools are built into the, the platforms that you work with. And something we saw in the, the, B &B, the Airbnb video with Hootsuite, um, there are definite advantages to being able to follow up on people. Um, but so I'm going to move on and in conclusion talk a little bit about the value of all of this. Um, I, I did a bunch of interviews with advertising professionals. And so the first thing that the advertising professionals suggest is valuable to companies in the social media space is the ability to surveil customers and talk about their brands. So people tell them the, the brand itself is only one half of the puzzle. Social media provides you the opportunity to listen to what people are saying and fill in the other half of that. So for example, um, Nespresso, which I mentioned earlier, I have a relationship with on social media, is they'll, they'll get to hear their fans talking about bringing back a certain product and they can do it. It's opportunities for highly visible, permanently archived customer service interventions. This is kind of a classic. Um, airlines. Airlines are really good at selectively helping people who they've previously screwed over on social media. Um, and then because it makes everybody else think that people are being helped. So they will, but someone will complain, oh, I've been stuck in the Minneapolis airport for 19 hours. And if they have a bunch of Twitter followers, magically uh, Delta Airlines Twitter feed will come in and say, well, someone's coming to the terminal to meet you now and get you booked on a new plane and you're going first class. And the big advantage for, for the, the organization is, of course, everybody can see that they've done that. So it makes everybody feel better about the company, even if only one person's actually getting helped. Um, they can distribute and promote user-generated branded content. So for example, when people like your organization or your product, and they find some way to express that like, it can in some ways remove the need to actually hire a creative person to create content for you. So yeah, for giving people the platform to create user-generated content which you can then distribute. Uh, and people who I talked to point out that what they call co-creation, it's really important the marketing team is typically overworked and kind of out of your idea. So if you have other, if you can find a way to crowdsource good ideas for marketing, that's fantastic. Uh, finally, they can collect information on, on self-identified customers. So as I mentioned, um, I'm going to show you the, the, the back end. You can start finding out who your customers are, who likes your product, where they come from, all those things. About. Finally, I'm going to talk about strategic communication. And as I mentioned, I talked about you know the importance of speaking in a voice and communicating with your audience. Uh, on one hand, and then professional, what we used to think of as professional advertising activities on the other hand. Um, and I want to encourage you, one of the big takeaways from today, I want to encourage you to think of those as, as two parts of the same thing. Strategic communication is a term uh, that we use to describe any communication activity that an organization takes that's persuasive, um, it's, in it's intended to influence people's behaviors and attitudes, and it also looks at everything an organization does in terms of communicating with the outside world. So not just <coughs> explicitly uh, marketing, marketing slogans and marketing, uh, marketing information, but everything, everything you say, the way your logo looks, the way your building looks, all of that. And I think that's where it's important for startups to think of social media activities. Not just in terms of a vehicle for promoting talking points about the company, but as a way of, of, of communicating of strategically communicating a persona and bringing to life the story of, of what you hope the company will be. So in summary, um, I'd say uh, that startups and strategic communication on, on social media are, uh, I think that there's a role for it. It's a very important decision, and I think it's a decision that many startups, in particular startups, which are, are student projects or have very young people who are very active on social media to too lightly. I think um, they can't be compartmentalized into sharing and spreading and engaging and chatting on one hand and advertising and marketing on the other. If you're going to engage in social media as a startup, I think it's really important to think of it as strategic communication and come up with a communication strategy. So see everything you do on social media as part of your, your marketing strategy. Uh, the major com commercial benefit at, at present is more on the conversation side than the paid advertising side, which is a great opportunity for startups, right? Like when we, when we talked about this at the beginning, I said, you know, people too often think of it as free marketing uh, and, and because they underestimate how much goes into that. 
Well, the good news is the place where it's really effective is the stuff that people are at least thinking of as free market. There's at least an option for it to be free. There's catches you have to do it really well. That works better than paying for a professional advertising campaigns of the kind where you dump a paid ad for, for a great new slot connects to some LinkedIn page. There are opportunities to really tell an interesting story and engage with fans about your brand. So in sum, the, the suggestions I'd leave you with are first, you have to develop a clear, a clear plan and strategy. I think that's been repeated. Um, don't make things up on the fly or set expectations that are completely unrealistic to your resources and talent and knowledge. And part of that is you just if you really don't think you can do this well, don't do it. Um, you, especially if you think you, if you don't think you can do it well and you don't need it. You have to cultivate a defined voice and persona for your company and always speak in it. And I think that, that's tough. Um, and that's tough in particular at the partnership phase when maybe everybody's really excited and they all want to say different things and they want to express their personality. But it, it, it's important to, to identify the, what social could do in terms of creating a persona around you, your organization and your brand and the extent to which you have to be strategic and disciplined and develop that persona and intentional and stick, stick to the script to a certain degree in order to, to, to make that happen. You have to think about the times when you send certain messages and the volume of media that you see. If you're always sending stuff at 4 o'clock in the morning, that's going to reflect on, first of all, no one's going to read it. Second of all, that's going to reflect negatively if you're dealing with a venture capitalist who's maybe a little concerned that you're too young and unprofessional uh, to invest a lot of money. They can go look at your social media and see you're sending stuff, especially poorly spelled, um, somewhat unwise stuff at 4 o'clock in the morning. That matters. Now, develop and build relationships with key brand ambassadors, key influencers, and fans. Not everybody on social media is interested in your product or your, your company or your startup is equal. Figure out who the ones who can actually really help you um, and reach out to them. And, and they, might be, they might end up being really important figures in the social media conversation around you. Invest in depth in certain platforms rather than superficially in, in many. So this is a big mistake that we see a lot. Um, startups invest in social media and they try to do Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and, uh, and everything. It's much better to do a couple of those well than it is to, to superficially or uh, incorrectly or even just kind of start them and then ignore them. Uh, so yeah, if you, don't, if you have limited resources, Pick two or three, do them well. People will find you. People who are looking for you on social media, they will find you. You don't have to worry about populating all those spaces. I don't, I don't think anyone's ever been denied venture capital funding because they didn't have a Tinder account or a Snapchat account for their, their company. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I'm just going to start, start by saying um, summary. So all organizations develop a long-term strategy. If it's done right, you can create a market, help you recruit talent and, and investors. On balance, it represents a high, high risk or reward proposition for many startups, and I think you need to be aware of that. And, and that you need to, to, to treat the seemingly distinct tasks of paid advertising, but also strategic communication as interrelated on social. And it's only when you do that that you can really start thinking about a, a real digital strategy, and a real digital strategy is really important. So I'm going to end there, and I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions. Um, understanding that there's pizza.